I'm, I, uh, uh, I direct the, the Human Computation Institute and lead the Eyes on Owls project. Um, but, um, you know, as anyone in citizen science knows, um, a project is, is the people uh, who are in it. So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the folks on our team um, who have made a huge difference in this project uh, and that I'm fortunate to work with, um, that you get a chance. And I'm sure you recognize some of them here. But it's not just the team. As you know, it's what I call team humanity. Um, and um, in particular, so we had a hangout uh, recently um, uh, to um, kind of celebrate uh, a recent success that we had with the project in terms of participation based on new team feature. And the folks that are circled are our participants, folks in the community who, who uh, uh, made huge contributions as uh, contributors. And as you can see, they're, they're part of the conversation, and we think it's important for them always to be part of the conversation. So, um, and also I noticed, so for, um, for any of my contemporaries, that for some reason it's just, you know, the Hollywood Squares thing when they started noticing the circles and that I was winning. Um, so, uh, you know, what I'm hoping to do, I, I can't get into the nuts and bolts in the amount of time we have, but I, I just want to talk about some problems that we had and the way that we went about solving those problems, and I'm hoping that, um, you know, that will be uh, generally useful to folks who are either embarking on a new project uh, that has uh, similar characteristics to ours, or who's uh, interested in improving um, uh, the efficiency of their, uh, of their platform. So the, the scope of uh, these problems, is the, the context is crowdsource classification. So you know the idea is a participant has shown something and they have to decide which uh, category of things it fits in. If it's an animal, you know, which is what the species is the, the class. And if it's a, a galaxy, the type of galaxy. Uh, and in our case, uh, in the stall catchers game, um, uh, which is about accelerating uh, Alzheimer's research, um, you know, we show a blood vessel and we just ask people to tell us, is this blood vessel flowing? Or is it stalled? And uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about, you know, you can go to stallcatchers.com and, and try playing it. Uh, I would encourage you to do that, of course. Um, <laughs> in our case, it's two-choice classification, um, which is kind of uh, the same thing as detection in a sense. So um, one class is the thing you're looking for, and the other class is um, uh, that it's not the thing you're looking for. And so uh, just in principle, even though um, we've applied uh, our approach to two-choice classification, you could take any um, multi-class problem and reduce it to that, you know, using, um, you know, the kind of the theoretical uh, model and come up with a similar approach because each class is then with respect to all other classes. So that's, that's all I'll say about that. Um, so the first problem we were trying to solve is, uh, is this problem of random uh, responders. Um, so, you know, one example of that is obviously a web bot. So, there, you know, there are folks out there who, I guess, have some spare time, and they're just interested in racking up a score on anything they can find, and they'll create a bot and see if the bot can put them to the top of the leaderboard. And um, we, you know, uh, just a, an aside, so sorry, I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, some of my uh, kind and close colleagues have uh, informed me that I'm occasionally long-winded. Um, I will try not to go down too many rabbit holes. Um, also, uh, out of respect to the next speaker, um, but um, anyway, we had some 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 folks early. It's just an interesting. So we had some folks early in the project who um, decided that if they could elevate their onto the leaderboard and they coordinate their behavior, they could change their usernames and put political messages up there. And they they actually did that. Uh, and then we realized that maybe we shouldn't allow people to change their usernames. Uh, so that was kind of an easy fix. But um, um, so there, there are kind of malicious actors. You know, another you know, random responding can happen in a lot of ways. And um, anyone who has a cat knows this is not just a joke. I mean, this kind of thing actually happens. Um, and you know, and then there uh, again, bad actors. And you know, as we all know, the best way to remain anonymous on the internet is to wear a ski mask when you're surfing the web. <laughs> Um, so, um, so what's exciting to me about um, about this is that my dissertation actually ended up being a useful thing. Um, and anyone who's done one, you know, you always wonder, like, is this really going to make a difference any time in my life? And um, and it, it happened, you know. So um, I don't know, I don't want to say how many years ago, but so I was studying uh, psychophysics, and then when I came to this project and this problem, I realized, well, you know, this actually could be useful. There's this whole field, and you know, folks who are in the field of astronomy or, uh, you know, 
of bio, uh, medical research. Um, they're not necessarily aware of psychophysics, but a lot of work has been put into developing, you know, methods, um, you know, to measure how people respond and to be able to kind of tease out, um, you know, how cognition works in exactly the kinds of classification tasks that we're studying here. So the big question that psychophysics tries to answer is, you know, given a stimulus um, and the response and knowing what those two things are, how can we, uh, you know, what kind of a, a cognitive model can we infer from that? And um, so, um, so a few decades ago, um, uh, some folks had this kind of brilliant insight, which is, uh, so in the field of radar engineering, they had this problem, which is that, um, you know, there's a, a, uh, there's a radar operator and then the radar equipment. And the radar equipment has a certain amount of sensitivity, so a blip shows up, and hopefully it shows up soon enough. You know, you, you, this is like, imagine wartime, enemy aircraft, that kind of thing. And then the operator has to decide, is that a real enemy aircraft or is that a pigeon, you know, for example. And there's a cost and benefit associated with making the right or the wrong decision. And um, there are two different kinds of mistakes you can make. So one mistake is to say that this enemy aircraft is a pigeon, so you don't launch a, you know, a defensive kind of maneuver. And, uh, you know, the, the, the consequence there is obvious, that you get attacked. And then the other kind of mistake you make is, um, that you assume the pigeon is an enemy aircraft. Um, you launched, you know, three aircraft to go and attack the pigeon, and you wasted a lot of time resources. Um, so um, the the really the, the key insight here is that with with the signal detection theory, um, anyone who has seen or used an ROC curve has used signal detection theory. Um, that receiver operator curve ROC comes from you know the radar uh, engineering field. Um, the key insight is that you can you can tease apart the sensitivity of the apparatus, the uh, the radar equipment, from the bias of the operator and the utility function the operator is using to make these decisions, the cost utility function. And uh, cognitive scientists said, you know, we can apply this, you know, to these indirect methods we're using, and we could actually figure out when somebody's answering classification questions, we can separately measure their sensitivity and their bias. They're actually with some very uh, uh, basic underlying assumptions that are fairly easy to um, measure and meet, um, that they're uh, statistically independent. And this becomes very powerful and helpful uh, for what we're trying to do. Um, oh yeah, and so I just, you know, Google's great. Um, yeah, it turns out there's actually, at one time, there was a, a very uh, measurable cost for making a mistake and taking out a pigeon, um, particularly if it's a homing pigeon. Um, so, um, so it turns out that um, when we used this approach and applied it, um, um, so I'm sorry, I need to back up a second. So, spoiler alert, it did work, but let me tell you what actually worked. So what we did is um, uh, we measured the sensitivity um, using sort of signal detection theory, and we applied it to our scoring function. And the idea is that um, if you're randomly responding, your sensitivity will always quickly go to zero. So any web bot, you know, any pet cat that starts tapping is going to drive your sensitivity down to zero quickly. And so uh, anyone who's trying to implement a random response approach um, or, or other kinds of ad hoc uh, response approaches um, will um, uh, will quickly lose their sensitivity, and if the scoring function is multiplied by the sensitivity, then your then the points you get for each annotation will be zero. And um, and so we ran some simulations, um, and uh, um, I'm not going to take time to explain the graph, but it worked. So that was uh, that was an exciting um, uh, an outcome, and um, one of the other uh, sort of benefits of this. Um, is we applied a moving window on sensitivity because some of our end users are, are Alzheimer's patients. We, we want them to uh, be empowered to make a difference in their own uh, um, uh, potential uh, you know, future treatment opportunities. Um, and there's this effect in Alzheimer's disease called sundowning, which uh, anyone who's been sick, you know that sort of af late afternoon, evening, you, you, know, you think you're, you're over your, your cold, but then you start to feel worse. Uh, and in Alzheimer's disease, this manifests as kind of a, a fuzziness, 
um, in, in you know, uh, cognition that happens at time of day. So what we want to do is be able to um, uh, kind of appropriately tailor uh, how, how we um, uh, incorporate their data depending on um, uh, their level of alertness. And not really not just for them, but for anyone. Um, so someone who might have a very high sensitivity one day and sits down with a beard to annotate, their sensitivity might drop a little and we just want to know about that for, for the benefit of the data. Um, so, the um, uh, problem in a lot of these uh, um, kinds of classification projects is how do you combine crowd answers, uh, or how do you combine individual answers into a single crowd answer that's, that's expert-like? Um, and, um, and so, um, you know, this, is, uh, this app has probably appeared on, on more uh, talks than, than any other. I love Malaria Spot. There probably, is anyone from Malaria Spot here in this? Um, I think someone's here at CSA, but um, it's a wonderful idea. So they had to test out how many annotations do we need you know, to analyze this blood smear and figure out if this person has malaria. Um, how many different answers do we need to combine to have an answer as good as a trained pathologist? Because, of course, that's the, the purpose of it, is, uh, is to use the crowd to accelerate that and replace um, something that would otherwise be time-consuming. And they found that their magic number was 23 and they did a, a validation study uh, to determine that. So, um, so we went ahead and conducted our own validation uh, study, and um, um, uh, what we determined was that, um, and you can see in this graph that for, you know, for, for five, with five annotations per vessel, that you know, we had one level of, uh, so I'm using sensitivity and specificity as, as um, uh, as metrics for um, you know the quality of the data, and um, that at a certain point, right after about 15, we cross the research threshold. So the research threshold is is what our biomedical collaborators, um, uh, you know, told us uh, uh, was uh, what was needed. Sorry, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm realizing that I don't know maybe I'm hitting the wrong button. I think I'm every time I hit the button, it skips two slides ahead, and that's why I'm kind of missing some key points, um, so I'll try to, I don't know. Um, so, um, uh, in any case, uh, what we, we discovered was that our magic number was between 15 and 20, but obviously for the benefit of the, of the uh, analysis, um, we had to be conservative, so, so we used 20. Um, so, that kind of solved the second problem, um, and, um, um, uh, and gave us confidence moving forward that the crowd answers were valid. Um, so our third problem um, was um, that, okay, so what, so you can imagine that when you're collecting 20, it's kind of, the, the, the strategy there is it's the worst case scenario. You know, there are probably other times if the responders have a very high sensitivity level, you don't need all 20 of those responses. Um, you might need only five expert, five very uh, sensitive annotators uh, to, to get um, uh, an expert-like answer. But the question is, how how do we, um, you know, how do we improve our efficiency? Kind of taking that sort of uh, thinking into account. So um, why would we want to improve our efficiency? Um, well, so there's the ethical obligation, um, you know, to the crowd. Uh, anyone who's spending a lot of time on this, and we have users who spend several hours a day actually annotating vessels, and we think about them, uh, we feel a sense of loyalty to them, um, and uh, and you know it's it's unethical to waste uh, human time. Um, and then um, you know the purpose of our project is to get to a cure or a treatment for Alzheimer's disease as fast as possible. It's a horrible disease, and it affects. Um, obviously not just the patients, but the families, and every second that there isn't a treatment, um, this is a, a terrible hardship. So um, we feel very motivated to solve this problem, and, and we've been working hard on it. So our strategy is assign weights, which we are, we're doing using our sensitivity uh, measure, and then um, to develop a way, whoops, um, to, to have a kind of a, a, a a, sen a way to measure sensitivity, not just in an individual, but in in um, in a collective mind, right? And um, so uh, there there's a precedent for this, and um, 
I, I guess in, in Galaxy Zoo number two, there are folks here who are going to correct me when I mess this up, um, that there was this, this notion of, um, I think it's consistency, which is, which is like a proxy or, or one way to, to say, you know, this person's answer is very much like all the other answers about this particular annotation, and that's the way that we assess their, their expertise. And, um, and so this is kind of a, a, a way to, uh, you know, again, assess something like the sensitivity that we're using. And then in this, um, this other project, the one that had the really, the really high bar of uh, participation, uh, what is it, uh, Space Warp, or, or is it, uh, if I'm saying it right. And, um, and in that case, um, their strategy was, um, to reduce the number of annotations was to use a stopping rule. And, and kind of do a random walk and say, once we've collected enough evidence for this, we're going to stop. So what we've done in effect is, and I stole this from Lucy's slides, uh, I almost just used her you know, talk, and I was just going to talk to it, but I thought that wouldn't really be ethical. So. Um, uh, so we sort of combined this approach, and again, our idea was to kind of extend this, uh, this model of um, measuring sensitivity at an individual level to, to um, measuring it in, in the collective mind. So, um, so that's what we did. Um, we came up with a collective sensitivity measure, and um, um, and so uh, you know we implemented that. And the, basically, um, after each annotation, we accumulate a collective sensitivity. When that collective sensitivity reaches a threshold, we stop collecting annotations. Why would you need to collect more if you know that uh, that you've achieved? You know that level of sensitivity, which means you have enough information to actually make a, a, a good a good response. And um, and as you can see, what we found is uh, at least with the same validation data that led us to our original magic number of 20, that we were able to using this method reduce that to only four annotations on average. Um, but it, it kind of uh, um, brought us to a new kind of magic number because in this case it's not really four annotations. It's not like we say we're going to collect four and stop. It's it's a variable number. So the new magic number is what what's the level of sensitivity that the collective uh, that the collective mind needs to to reach before we stop, and then that governs what that what that number of annotations is. And and so on average it's four, but sometimes it's two, and sometimes it's ten. But in all cases, it's a lot less than 20, which is what we were aiming for. And, um, and so it's really, um, and we're applying this to some new data sets now. It turns out um, that it's a little higher than, than an average of four. It's more like an average of seven. But relative to 20, um, it's about a threefold improvement in uh, uh, efficiency. So um, that's all I have to say. Um, I don't know if we, we're probably out of time, uh, which is why um, I just want to invite you to you know, find me later uh, if you're interested in talking more about this. And if you have uh, related methods, I'd love to learn about that as well. So thank you.